There was once a man named Hassan. Not that long ago, this happened. The story which I'm going to tell you. It introduces what I'm going to be talking about now is the Magi of Christmas. Hassan spent two years in quiet witness to Jesus, to Muslims, in the city of in the old city of Cairo in Egypt. He had an undercover ministry there to be a witness to Jesus Christ. One night, he was forcibly awakened, forced at gunpoint to an abandoned warehouse. And there, he found ten Muslim men standing around a single candle. He thought his life was over, but he saw them smile at him. And his kidnapper said, we are imams, and we all studied at Al-Azhar University. During our time there, each of us had a dream about Jesus, and each of us privately became a follower of Christ. For a time, we didn't dare tell anyone about this. It would, of course, have been our own death sentences. But finally... We could hide it no longer. We each prayed to Jesus for help to learn what it means to be his follower. Over time, he brought us together. And you can imagine our amazement when the Holy Spirit revealed there are other imams who have found Jesus as well. Now we meet here three times a week to pray for our families and for the people in the mosque to find Jesus too. We know you follow Christ. He has led us to you. At that point, Hassan could simply laugh in joy and relief for several minutes. And the kidnapper apologized and said, it was the only way to get him there. And then he asked, will you teach us the Bible? The reason I tell you this whole story is to show what we're going to be talking about in depth in another way, that the God of the Bible has often done unusual things over the ages to reach people who are open to him. He knows who's open to him. He knows who wants to learn more. And this is a story of the Magi, or as some people call them, the wise men in Matthew. It's often been romanticized, embellished with fictional details. And some of those fables are the types of things that the Bible tells us not to listen to, not to listen to fables, 1 Timothy 4.17. We don't know how many uh, magi there were. Um, the number of gifts, and we go into the passage, it makes people think that there might have been three, but we don't know. It could have been two, there could have been 20. We don't know from the gospel itself. Anything else was embellished later on, it seems. And this whole story seems to have come straight to Matthew who is the traditional author of the Gospel of Matthew, very credible to call him the author of the Gospel of Matthew. And as we go into this, as we go into the Gospel, we can see that uh, this probably had kind of like the other parts of the Gospel from James, the eldest half-brother of Jesus. Maybe perhaps one of the other brothers Might have had something to say about this too, because we know that after the resurrection of Jesus, all his brothers came to faith in him. And it shows a theme that there are people who we might expect to be receptive to Jesus, yet turn out to be indifferent and sometimes even hostile, while others unexpectedly show up to respond to him to receive that all. God has for them in Jesus, in this wonderful person who's come. And we can see this happening throughout the ministry of Jesus too. The people that expect to respond, indifferent and hostile, sometimes the people that you would expect not to respond are those who receive you most gladly. Look as you read throughout the Gospels, you can see it happen often. Those who expect you what would welcome his presence didn't, others that one might expect being different, respond with enthusiasm. Maybe even God goes out of his way to bring them the good news of Jesus. So, Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, 
Hmm. Matthew chapter 1 only talks about Jesus being in, uh, Joseph being in Nazareth, but all of a sudden they talk about his birth in Bethlehem. That assumes Luke chapter 2. <coughs> Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king. Behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born? King of the Jews, for we saw his star. Translation here says, when it rose, could also say, in the east, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with it. When assembling, all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. And they told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. Behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And they came, and going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Wow. So, God shows a way to those who are open to his king. The guidance may be unusual with Hassan and the imams. It may be something that others don't notice. They might not even know about it. But God provides for general spirit, those who have general spirit, spiritual interest, he provides guidance to the salvation in Jesus. And sometimes peculiar circumstances really do bring unlikely people to seek after the God's salvation. Sometimes things happen that guide the most unlikely people to shock the sensibly and respectably religious people of this world when they start to seek out the truth of God's chosen king. All of a sudden, Magi, up here in Jerusalem. The educated class, probably from Mesopotamia, modern Iraq, maybe around Babylon, maybe they were from an area that was under Parthian rule at that time. That's probably true. That they crossed over the border from the Parthian Empire into the Roman Empire. And Roman Empire, Parthian, Parthian Empire um, really didn't get along that well at this time. But this was a time right not then. That there was some kind of an uneasy peace between them. So they, uh, they probably got over the border okay. And uh, when we find hear about these magi, when we talk about the Old Testament, the prophet Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, they were educated by the magi. And uh, they were considered to be part of that class as they, as they lived in Babylon. And so the magi were very well educated Learned, learned all the literature. They probably would have learned, known several languages, and also astronomy and astrology. Astrology and astronomy were very, very close together at that time. Um, we find right that uh, recently the Antikythera mechanism was uh, from before that time. Actually, it was found in a ship, uh, salvaged from a ship, shipwreck off Greece. And it's a little analog computer which computes in very precise detail the movements of the stars, astrology. And the reason astrology is forbidden is because that treats the stars themselves and the planetary bodies as deities. And that's why it was forbidden, because there is only one God, the God of the Bible, and he is the one who came. So they were most likely Gentiles. 
They may have known Jews in the East. They saw this star that they thought indicated the birth of the Messiah. They were correct, but we don't know why. We don't know what the star was. Probably not a planet. They knew what planets were. Probably would have been described as planet. Our word planet is a word which comes from ancient astronomy. Uh, a comet would have been a harbinger of doom. They recognized comets as harbingers of doom. Maybe it was a supernova. That's my personal opinion. There are um, some sources I've come across say that there was a supernova reported in Chinese records. I don't know, but that seems to me to be the best explanation. One of a kind occurrence, and it might have been visible even in daylight. We don't know how that star was tied to the Messiah. No one's ever been able to really uh, see categorically identify a place in Old Testament prophecy that points to a star in this way, a specific star. Nothing that indicated exactly what it was. There is uh, prophecy in the, the book of Moses, uh, Numbers, which talks about a star will rise from David, or a star will rise from Israel. Not from David. David hadn't been born yet. But we don't know if there's anything definite in Old Testament Messianic prophecy. There's some speculation, a source or two, that thinks that Prophet Daniel might have uh, had some private prophecy that was passed on. We don't know. That's possible. But still, even if they, you know, if there had been anything definite in Old Testament prophecy's heart, because Matthew is the gospel that reports us, and Matthew is a specialist among the gospels in Old Testament prophecy. You would have assumed that he would have put it in there if, if they'd been anywhere in the Old Testament. But we don't know how they knew this. They tied the star. But they were right. But they still needed, as they came into Jerusalem, looking for the headquarters of the Jews, Jerusalem, that would have been known. They would have been able to figure that out, go there, find out from them. The Jewish scholars with the Old Testament would guide them to the correct city. Indicate that they may not have even had the whole Old Testament in front of them, may not have even had the prophecy of Micah, which is what they quote here. Micah chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Still needed the guidance of these Jewish scholars to guide them to the correct city. And for all this, we don't see any endorsement of astrology or even that again that was the most the motive for most ancient astronomy or for how they had lived but they somehow had this star they saw pointing to the messiah and what this shows us about god how the heavens declare the glory of god Matthew, Psalm chapter 19, verse 1, how the heavenly bodies mark out seasons and days and years, not there for our worship, not to, there to consider that they have any direct effect on our lives, not to rule over the lives of men and women as minor deities. There to declare the glory of the God who created them, who rules over them. And he had already prepared from the very creation of the universe this star, however it was, appeared there to be a unique sign to the birth of his son, and he held it until the right time. God provided this star to direct them to his son, the Savior, the people who didn't have the perfect background. They weren't the people that you would expect to come seeking the son. Out of all the people in the world, these guys, these magi, come seeking the son. Behind that we see the God of ultimate might, power, wisdom, preparing, governing his creation. What we could call the anthropic principle in action. That our universe is specially tuned to human beings. Created, fine-tuned to the presence of humanity and a witness to humanity. The star that would mark the birth, the unprecedented, that would come 
and show these men there. And it would happen also. We also see that the heavenly bodies will declare the glory of God. There is unprecedented darkness at the hour of the death of Jesus. And the heavenly signs will come too. The sun will be darkened. The moon will be darkened. Joel chapter 2 verses 30 and 31 you can also see repeated Isaiah, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Revelation. Heavenly signs to come as the harp. Those were the harbingers of doom to come for the ungodly and hope is the, for the godly. So, we find these people having the correct response. And Queen Victoria, and actually Queen Elizabeth too, is known to repeat this. After a sermon on the second coming of Christ, Queen Victoria said, I wish you would come in my lifetime so I could take my crown and lay it at his feet. That's what they came to do. And yet, even as they came to do that, there was an Antichrist spirit there. An Antichrist spirit of this world that was seeking to hinder and sabotage the presence of God's chosen king in this world. And we need to realize where people seek, the Antichrist seeks to hinder. The ultimate enemy of our souls is there. And this realization is necessary there is an ultimate Antichrist to come and his predecessors, like happening there in Jerusalem, there have been at work in this world for many years. When these people appeared, these Magi appeared in Jerusalem, Herod the king heard, and that unsettled still further, the already unsettled status quo there's no indication that this was known outside of Jerusalem. Herod was the king there. He was not really of Judea, of Jewish ancestry. He didn't come from the line of, of Judah. But he was Edomian and Edomite in ancestry. His forefather was Esau. And he had come to kingship as being appointed by the Roman senator under the sponsorship of Marcus Antonius, Mark Antony, as we see him in the Shakespeare plays. And at this time, he was already diseased in old age, maybe 67, 68 years old. And he was having problems with his own succession. He disowned his son Antipater, Archelaus, who he find mentioned a little bit later in this gospel Herod Antipas who took over Galilee finally confirmed we find his family in the gospels so this is the guy this is the person who was there he was an extremely unpopular king in his last days and having this threat of a legitimate king from the line of David being mentioned. Wow. Even in just a rumor, wow. There's someone being born there, wow. There was a lot of unrest and conflict in these day, last days of Herod. So, we do find that his last years were a bloody nightmare. And this Antichrist episode was only a minor footnote. footnote the reign of a man who was even by the pagans said that he ruled like a wild beast and the coming and the presence of Christ we often do find the antichrist spirit of fallen humanity is one of the reactions to the coming of the presence of Jesus we have the same tendency of the world spirit today to seek to overcome Christ coming through his people the antichrist resistance is ultimately going to be futile though because God's purposes are going to prevail despite every stratagem and force in this world. Some will still react with hostility to the truth in Jesus when he comes. When his gospel comes with a threat to something that they hold foolishly dear to themselves. The British missionary Oswald Chambers once said, If we remain true to Jesus Christ and to his command to preach in his name, it will mean encountering hostility when you come into contact with the culture and wisdom and education is not devoted to Jesus. Oswald Chambers, who served not far 
from where Hassan and his imams who became his friends and brothers in Christ talked about encountering hostility with wisdom, culture, and education not devoted to Jesus. And often those who are closest to the facts about God's salvation are insensitive to his actual presence. The deepest knowledge of the facts of Scripture may not lead someone to actually seek after God's chosen king. They may have the knowledge, but may not, may not actually follow up on that. So the Magi, when they came, They posed a question to the Jewish religious scholars. They gave the correct answer from Micah chapter 5, verse 2. You can find it in the Old Testament. And they were complacent, and they played it safe by coughing up the correct answer from the scriptures when they were challenged. But they didn't show any further interest in answering the question correctly. And that's all it was to them. The scripture doesn't explicitly call out their sin, still you have the sense that once they heard about this, the facts did not lead them to investigate further and follow along with the Magi to find the king. Perhaps they were trying to play it safe in dangerous days. Herod was there. Herod was known to be brutal. Perhaps they feared for their lives. But you can see that they really weren't very enthusiastic about the presence of the Messiah. They didn't do much beyond coughing up an answer. Dead orthodoxy and spiritless religiosity, knowledge of the scriptures, knowing the right things may not affect our lives and that can be dangerous. The correct answer would have been mourning over the state of affairs that was happening in Jerusalem at that time. Heartfelt, heartfelt prayers for God to come and correct things. There were those people there. You see them in the Gospel of Luke, Simeon and Anna. Yeah? Okay. Well, I'm not sure they got the right name there, but Simeon and the other lady there. But people get still get caught up, wrapped up in their own lukewarmness, get complacent in their own cares, even though they don't realize their dire need and they need to seek the Lord who has come. The evangelist Vance Haver once said, a church had a sign up front, Jesus only. One night a storm blew out the first three letters and left us only. Too many churches have come to that, us only. They may be able to cough up answers when you pose questions, but has it affected their lives? Are they seeking the king? Billy Graham once said, Christ does come to us every day in the form of Bibles we do not read, in the form of churches we do not attend, in the form of human need that we pass by. I am convinced that if Christ came back today, He'd be crucified more quickly than he was 2,000 years ago. We give ourselves too much credit if we think that we would have behaved any better than the people did in the first century toward Jesus. So the God of the Bible knows the end from the beginning, from the smallest to the greatest, and he sets up and arranges circumstances in advance to bring the salvation of his Son to those who seek it. There are no little people to him in all the immensity of the created universe, no one too insignificant to reach with the gospel. And God protects the future of his salvation despite the threats of this world. Those who seek his salvation find further protection and guidance from God, even against the schemes of this world as they go on and follow him. God will overrule the attempts of those who in this world who seek to hinder his will. The God of the Bible easily and does sidestep and redirect circumstances so that the hostile intentions of men, the murderous intentions of men, are overthrown. Herod may have thought, as we go on, verses 7 through 12, that he's being sly. Did not send soldiers as an escort to the young men, to the wise men, to the magi. 
thought he was being sly. He's, he's known throughout his reign that he had these spies and secret agents. May have thought that he was going to outsmart and get ahead of this somehow. But he did not outsmart God. There's been a lot of some speculation, some of it needlessly nasty towards the star that move, uh, that moves along in the sky. Well, it simply might have appeared that way. The ancient people knew the movements of the stars well. These magis, uh, these men would have known how the stars moved. <laughs> may have appeared that way, may have simply appeared to the south as they went on the road the south from Jerusalem to Bethlehem. There is a road which is known there. So that appeared on their journey to go ahead of them and so that appeared over the correct house which would have been the ancestral home of Joseph. And there's nothing in this narrative which really requires the star to move around. It was possible, could have been possible simply through the normal rotation of the earth and the placement of the star in the heavens and it's about an hour and a half, six mile journey to, Jer to Bethlehem from Jerusalem. So it looks more like the circumstances God provi providentially arranged them long before so that they would be pointed to the correct place. Doesn't require something weird about the star moving around from heaven. They would have thought that was weird since they spent their lives watching stars. And ancient astronomy was actually kind of advanced. This is a fairly old book. Astronomy, Fred Hoyle. I had this for 50 years, but I'm not gonna show you really just think of it. One of our modern the Palomar Telescope, right here, people using a straight stick to measure movements of the stars. Ancient Egyptian. Measuring the later quadrant. All ways to measure and view the stars, track their movements without the use of a telescope. And the camel knew the movements of the stars quite precisely. So they didn't have to see the star move in the sky. That would have been quite unusual to them, but they would have found the placement of the star guiding them, arranged in providence long before. And they brought these gifts the expression of their homage and submission, peculiar appropriateness to Jesus, gold as to a king, incense as to God, myrrh, which was used for embalming as someone who's going to die. Well, what happened to the gifts? Um, probably they were financed, what were used to finance the fight in Egypt, which takes place after uh, verse 13 later on here in the time in Egypt which they spent until they returned after the death of Herod which would have been not, not that long after after this so God then went on and protected the Magi and the family by dreams Magi were returned were warned not to return to Herod, Herod to escape the schemes of Herod. They were warned in that dream and departed to their own country by another way. And personal guidance from God to deal with the folly and hostility of the coming of his son was given right there. So, God provides guidance in this world and his guidance is going to be to Jesus Christ as a savior. I opened this with some speaking about dreams and visions of Jesus in the Muslim world. It seemed to have been happening primarily in the past generation. Those who come to Christ in the Middle East from Muslim background, one third of them seem to have them. 
This does happen. It happens in Scripture. Guidance here given to the Magi, to Joseph through dreams, and to Cornelius in Acts chapter 10 with dreams. Guidance of dreams and visions since the coming of the Holy Spirit is consistent with the way God works in our world. We have guidance and protection in the mission to bring Jesus Christ in the world through God's guidance there. And this is so different. The way that God works in the, these ways. Different than the trite personal prophecies that our spiritually unstable, immature, ignorant, and presumptuous people give to a lot of people nowadays in our churches. Somebody gets an idea, they attach it, thus seeth the Lord to it, and try to put that on someone else. These are something different. They're given through dreams, and I believe they're real, of course. We need to be in the Word, though, to know His promises, His expectations, to know Him. And he will give us his guidance as he will. He's not going to mislead us. We can misread him, but he's not going to mislead us. And we have the word to guide him above all. To guide us through him. To know how to follow Jesus, just like those imams he needed to have someone lead them through the word. So the proper response to Jesus today, when he comes to seek us today, is submission to him as King, Lord, and Savior. The gifts we bring now are not money and material, but ourselves. He's not hard to find. He will be where he said he will be. There was once a woman who went, was suspicious something was going on with her husband. She went around trying to figure out where he spent his evenings, and so she finally came home and found him there. We'll find, we can look for Jesus in all the wrong places. We'll find him here in his word. We'll find a savior there. Often enough in this world, God allows the most unlikely people to come out unexpectedly to seek and to find his salvation in his son Jesus. Certainly scripture warns us that not all will finally accept Christ as not all did during his lifetime when he was physically there performing miracles right in front of them. We cannot expect all to receive the truth before he returns in glory. And it should be a great shame and rebuke to so many who have so much in the way of opportunity and available knowledge about the Messiah, and yet who pass by every day with indifference. They're looking for everything but what God says is most important. And they may complain to God about the status quo, about how it doesn't measure up to what they think it should be. But they're unwilling to come to the Christ who came to save them. And so, what's your response today? What's the proper response? The proper response to the king means submission to his authority as king and lord as he now is. No longer a child. We're not submitting to a child. We're submitting to a crucified and a risen lord died on the cross for us who is living now. We're making a conscious personal commitment to him as he's presented to us in the gospel and is present in the power of his spirit. And it means that we bring him our ultimate gift not our money, not our material things, but ourselves. So, how will you respond now to Jesus Christ? This is good news that the King has come. There will be a greater urgency in our own lives to make the good news known to others as we know that the King has come. Is the King personally welcome in your life? Do you know the King personally? He comes to be a living and a saving presence in the life of the person who consciously and definitely puts his or her faith in him. He is welcome in our lives today if we received his salvation and his companionship. That's the welcome that he wants. He's not welcome if we keep him at a distance, if we're trying to depend on someone else's faith and obedience 
to get into the kingdom. If we got relatives and we think that they're going to bring us in with them, no. We come to him ourselves. If we're trying to live just in association with them, we hope it'll rub off that we can come on their coattails. No. He's welcome if he's received as he's come to be received. As we bow down, each one of us for him. Acknowledge him as Lord and Savior to receive his salvation by faith in him, him alone. And in this season, does the King continue to be welcome in your life? If you welcomed him at one time, by faith in him for your salvation, your eternal salvation, do you walk with him day by day? Is he welcome to command you for what he wants? And then does he find a joyful submission to his commands? Do you walk with him daily in fellowship, in love, faith, and obedience? Do you welcome also the return of the king? He's coming back in glory. Does his return excite you? Do you look forward to the time that he comes to bring his eternal kingdom? Isn't that great news for this tired old world and our weary lives? Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Talking about his return in glory. He came, and we remember that at Christmas, but he's coming, coming back. I don't know what we would call that, except he's returning. Wouldn't you want to make that known to others also? That great news for this tired, old worry world for our weary lives, that Jesus is returning. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. I hope this is ministered to you. Till next time. God bless.